got a lot from Nancy Wayne. She was um, she was the real deal. Swapping French luxury for French resistance. I feel like Nancy Wayne became the most wanted woman in Europe. If you don't do it, I will. Yes, there were deaths, yes, there were tears, but she was a flower that bloomed in wartime. A dangerous time to live, a dangerous time to fall in love. Nancy was a natural leader by her enthusiasm, her exuberance, and by her example. And she showed me this scar, this bayonet scar. From there to there, where a German soldier had slid a wide open. And realized, gee, you know, she really must have been something in the day. As the assassination of Yugoslavian King Alexander threw the world on a fast track to war, Nancy Wake was already a woman in a hurry, already a world away from her New Zealand home. Yes, this is Nancy Wake in Marseille. She became the Gestapo's most wanted woman, nicknamed the White Mouse, with a multi-million figure price on her head. She finished World War II as a hard-drinking special agent, a leader of resistance fighters, and a celebrated hero decorated in England, France, and the United States. But Nancy began it all as an adventurous reporter. And there she is, um, drop-dead gorgeous New Zealand-Australian woman, learning French, working, at, working as a journalist. So she'd strut up and down the boulevards and go to the restaurants, and she formed great friendships with her fellow journalists, most of whom were men, who looked after her. And, you know, the French have always valued, no joke, a gorgeous woman, of whom she was one. So then I ran back to my hotel and typed up the story. <laughs> right place, right time. You were born lucky, Nancy. Born who attracts trouble. Same thing, isn't it? Someone that runs away from home at 16 and makes their life for themselves and teaches themselves to be a, a journalist in Europe and teaches themselves a foreign language. I think that's a pretty self-contained kind of person. Excuse me, mademoiselle. I've seen you somewhere before, I think. In Marseille, the Hotel de Louvre. That's where I stay when I'm working. Yes. I'll never forget a beautiful face. <laughs> I'm Henri Fiocca. Nancy Wake. Enchanté. And you are from? New Zealand, originally. You're a long way from home, Nani. It's Nancy. And actually, I'm quite at home right here. My telephone number. <clears throat> next time you're in Marseille? I'll be there next week. So will I. Convenient. But I don't ring gentlemen, Monsieur Fiocca. Gentlemen, ring me. Call it my foreign policy. Au revoir, mademoiselle. Foreign <laughs> policy. <laughs> she described herself as a giddy young thing, but I don't think she was that giddy. Uh, she always struck me as the kind of woman who knew what she wanted, and she knew how to get it. Bonjour, mademoiselle. You have a visitor. Bonjour, Nancy. Merci, Antoine. How did you know I was here? You are staying a week? <laughs> then I'm off. Vienna, Berlin. Why? You must have heard what's happening. I want to get the story firsthand, get a look at De Führer. Why you? Others can go, let them. And miss the action. What possible reason would I... Maybe I should have listened to Henri. Even as a journalist, it made me feel sick to my stomach. 
absolutely fired her up. Everything she saw about Nazism just absolutely in her, it reviled her soul. She was appalled by everything she saw of it. And, you know, she made the vow, if I ever get a chance to do something, I will. At one point, she goes to Austria and she sees firsthand the way the Jews are being mistreated. And there was at one point, she on the cobbled streets of Vienna, she saw a Jewish man who, his major crime was being Jewish, and he was being beaten by a stormtrooper. And that just absolutely made Nancy's blood boil. It was at that point she realised just how brutal the Nazis were and that she, along with others, would have to do something about it. The invasion of France was a huge moment of incredible trauma for the French because they had been led to believe throughout the period between the wars that, that, that they would win quite easily. Then she immediately wanted to be in the action. She didn't need to do so. She was married to a very successful French businessman. She was quite safe. She could have seen out the war, living quietly with him. Nancy adored Henri. Um, I think marrying him to an extent was a, a means to an end for her because it gave her a degree of social status and connections within polite Marseille society. What can you do? They won't take you as a nurse if tried. Yes, but they're desperate for more ambulances and drivers. You've got trucks at the factory. Convert one for me and I'll drive it to the Belgian front. It won't cost you much. Huh. Lonnie, you eat money like no one else I know. Give me a truck. You don't even know how to drive. I can learn. After Marshal Pétain, had, uh, who was the hero of the First World War, had basically sued for peace with Hitler and said, you know, we've, we've got to throw in our lot, we've got to collaborate. There's only one man, General de Gaulle, who refuses to accept the idea of an armistice and sets himself up in London and does this extraordinary speech on the 18th of June, the day, the day after Pétain's, calling for the flame of resistance to not to go out. <laughs> que l'honneur des Français consiste à continuer la guerre aux côtés de leurs alliés et nous sommes résolus à le faire. She became involved bit by bit with a Scot by the name of Ian Garrow who helped organise the local resistance movement. Oh, simple. This is ridiculous. We can support the goal in other ways. I have money. Transport, factories. Yes, we'll use those too, but this is my chance to do something. You already did. You drove an ambulance. Oh, yes, for five minutes, while you fought at the front line in two wars. Well, I'm a just not a competition. Well, no, not anymore. <sighs> Sorry, Garo, carry on. What else? Once the radio parts are hidden, it's really a matter of courage, passing the German checkpoints. All right. It's not all right. You should never have been asked to do this. But I was. You can't make me say no. I'm asking you to be reasonable. And it's unreasonable to want to help liberate France. Nonny, please. I'm doing it, whether you like it or not, so you might as well shut up about it. Listen to yourself. You know, resistance is no place for rich, spoiled, temperamental women. No, no place at all, which is exactly why they want me. If she goes out there, if you go out there with that stuff in your coat, they'll find it. You'll be dragged away. I'll never see you again. 
Is that what you want? That won't happen. I think for Nancy, the thrill of the chase was, was half of the fun. Um, she certainly wanted to fight the good fight, um, but also the idea of doing something under the radar, outfoxing the Nazis, that would have been part of the thrill for her. German checkpoints, don't have a barricade across the road, and there'd be swarthy German men with guns on their guard, and they're looking for the enemy. And what is the enemy going to look like? Well, it's going to look a bit like them. It's going to be men with guns. And there's a there's a beautiful, beautiful fraud line going past. Where are these men? Where are these men with guns? And, and that was, and Nancy always felt that her sexiness, uh, her attractiveness, was a was perhaps her greatest weapon that that she had. So someone like Nancy, who would have helped to mobilise, would have helped to transport, would have had the networks, um, would have been absolutely crucial. And also, perhaps, she was quite a wealthy woman. These, these networks had to be financed, and the money was incredibly important and something that the resistance was very dependent on. She wasn't fearful of being caught, which is remarkable. So she... she backed herself against, you know, the Gestapo or the police or anybody else that was after her. She thought she could outwit them. Packages and radio parts were all links in a secret chain that smuggled prisoners and soldiers down the escape lines and out of France. We knew that every man we got home was a thorn in Hitler's side, and it felt fantastic. The escape lines really began in the north of France and in Belgium and to a little extent in Holland, whereby quite a lot of soldiers from the British Army were left behind and needed to escape. And then when the bombing of Germany began and some of the crews had to bail out and land uh, in occupied Europe, then the local population in part was at great pains to try and get them to safety. Nancy joined an escape line which was one of the best of all, most effective of all. It was run by a man who took the name of Pat O'Leary, who um, had set up an arrangement to smuggle people out either across the, um, uh, the Mediterranean to Spain or over the Pyrenees into Spain. Just me to hear your clothes, feel free to put in here. Uh, here is your passport there. Now a lot of things needed to be done. Someone had to go and collect them from a safe house and bring them to another safe house and then take them from the safe house to hand them over to someone else who would hand them over to a guide. Nancy's role was really as a courier in all this and she really was, if you like, the gopher, a very effective gopher for the Pat line. Something to remember, Spy. <laughs> There were German agents all over the place, of course. Good luck, Nancy. But she really wanted to be into the action and into it as fully as possible. And I have no doubt, having studied her personality from the beginning, that she was extremely active and was seeking uh, Pat O'Leary's permission to do more and more in the Pat line. She was the kind of woman who could read situations and read people, um, read people's reactions to her. She obviously knew how to play certain situations to her advantage. She had this kind of intuition. Garrow at one point brought another man to her home. His name was Paul Cole. Hello, Garrow. Afternoon, Madam Fioka. I hope you don't mind us calling unannounced. I'd like to introduce Mr. I don't care who that man is. He's not welcome here. I beg your pardon? You heard me. Please leave. Now. Why? What have I... I asked you to leave. Do I have to throw you out myself? Fine. I'm going. Crazy bitch. Why don't you even bring me here? And don't come back. If Nancy didn't like you, you'd certainly know about it. She had uh, the kind of personality that would flick on and off like a light switch. So, I mean, if there was somebody in the house who she thought was a collaborator or an informer, um, she would have sniffed them out pretty quickly. Fought at Dunkirk, my foot. Cole was a coward, a thief and a Gestapo spy. 
He betrayed Garrow and 50 others, but he never even mentioned my name. To him, I was just some silly, spoilt, clueless woman. So he forgot all about me. I think the coal episode was seminal, and I think that that confirmed in her. My instincts are good. If in doubt, back me, back my own, back my own feelings on things. The Germans had a code name for her. They were aware that there was this woman working against them, a beautiful woman they would hear tell of, and it seemed that every time they had her cornered, she would get away, and they called her the White Mouse. But it was also clear that sooner or later they really were going to come for her because the Germans became more and more aware of her activities, things became hotter and hotter. My instincts began humming. Then one day my friend, a cafe owner on the corner, whispered a warning. Nancy, this morning you were followed. You have to get out. Use the escape line. Go to England. What about you? If they suspect me, then... I'll be fine. I'll follow you later. When? When I'm sure the business can survive without me. <sighs> I have to think of my father. My workers, their families. These are bad times. I have a duty. You understand? Yes, of course I do. I know the man I married. I don't want to run away either. I feel like a coward. No, this is a tactical retreat. Any clever white mouse would do it. I still can't believe I have a code name in Berlin. A code name? A dossier? You're on the Nazis' most wanted list. It's enough, Noni. Now, take this. Your lucky five pound note, isn't that what you call it? It's only lucky if I get to spend it on you. As soon as you get to London, send me word. I'll be there when I can. She was always up front with me that, you know, the love of my life was my first husband, Henri Fiocca. And so to have left him under those circumstances was a bitter blow because, she, you know, where she wanted to be, she wanted to be with Henri. She wanted to be Madame Fiocca. She said she was heartbroken. And she was also worried about what might happen uh, uh, if she disappeared. But at the same time, if both she and Henri left at the same time, then that would have been instantly suspicious. Enjoy your shopping. Bonjour. Bonjour. Find something I like. Don't I always? Henri, I know you won't be faithful to me while I'm away, and nothing I can say will make you faithful. Henri. But I want you to know I will never ask. And you have to promise me that you won't ask me either. Why are you saying this to me now? Are you trying to make me jealous? No. It's because it's wartime and... I don't know what's going to happen. I love you. Bye, my darling. See you soon. Bonjour. She left Henri in a pretty bad circumstances. He volunteered to stay behind and, and cover for her. I, she knew that she'd run out of luck and had to get the hell out of there. The staggering thing is, despite having worked in this network to get all these people through across the Pyrenees, for her, getting to England was just about impossible. I caught the train west, heading for the Pyrenees. I'd already cried my way to the station, always looking over my shoulder. I wrote to Henri, pretending I was leaving him. I hoped the bloody Gestapo would read that letter too. La milice est à bord et il contrôle tout le monde. Halt, stehen bleiben. Wo wollen Sie denn hin, Sir? Her fearlessness, is, I think, divides her from the rest of us. Thinkers get scared, I think. People who have got um, think too much about consequences. When the chips were down, I don't think she allowed herself that luxury. Yeah. 
the interesting thing okay. with Nancy at the point that she's in jail that would be very close to the low point of her war because there she is she's one of the most wanted women in Europe she's top of the Gestapo list when they asked why I was on the train I said I'd had a fight with Henri and walked out they called me a liar said my ID was fake that I was a prostitute from Lourdes who had set off a bomb and run away <laughs> They interrogated me for four days, but never once checked my story. I told them nothing. Mercifully, they don't know. The, the authorities don't realise that the woman they've got in cell B uh, is, the, is the white mouse, and because she's not, she's not telling them who she is, and she's not, she's not cooperating at all. But her fear was, they'll work it out. Next thing I'll know, it'll be a firing squad, and I'll be, I'll be gone. One day, she looks up, and there is a familiar face, and it's Patrick O'Leary. What the hell are you doing? Getting you out of here. I'm Elise Command, you're my mistress, so act like it for God's sakes. What oh, it is you? I've given up hope. I had to be discreet. It took time, but I'm here now. Your husband is a very important man, a close friend of Premier Laval, who, as you know, is head of Melissa. Come, madame, the ladies' possessions, please. And if there's one thing French authorities, you know, respected it was a man coming to get his mistress but I understand that don't let me don't let me get in the way of it so O'Leary gets her out it's all here O'Leary ID cards money jewelry but a premier Laval to us approve it wasn't it was a bloody stupid risk you took worthy of the white mouse Henri told me your family's now I should be impressed does he know you were captured? No. Soldiers, go, go. It's a bloody coincidence. It has to be. It's not. If you have a spy, someone close. I can feel it, O'Leary. Like shit on the liver. I was right. There was another spy. A Gestapo agent called Le Neveu. The bastard had betrayed us every which way. O'Leary was arrested and there was no telling how many other names had been dished up. And at one point in her travels, she found herself within 100 yards of her house back in Marseille. And what she desperately wanted to do was to go and you know, see her husband and say, I'm still alive and I'm still going strong. She felt that it was too dangerous, both for her and for him, so she didn't. And so there was no contact passed between her and Henri after she left. The Pat Line helped hundreds of people make the crossing to Spain but it needed good weather and good luck. Three months I'd waited for my chance, three long months from leaving Henri to leaving France, and this old boy wasn't gonna stop me now. I told him, sweetly, that I'd drag him by his cui if he didn't keep walking. By this point in those early 1940s, from the point of view of London, what you looked across the channel and saw was you saw Europe occupied by the Germans just about everywhere but you also saw these pinpricks of light these little resistance movements that, that had been sprinkling up and they knew a little bit about them but they didn't know a lot of them but but Churchill's idea was to set up an organizing body which was subsequently became known as the special operations executive he wanted these people to go and set Europe ablaze and he really meant it in terms of sabotage, the wrecking of railways, the wrecking of um, factories that were working for the German war effort, and make life completely intolerable for the Germans occupying France.
she gets back to London. She hears about the special operations executive and, uh, you know, she goes to knock on their door. Knock, knock, knock. Who's there? Nancy Wake. Come on in. And they train her up over many, many months. And it's almost a forerunner of M MI6. It's almost a forerunner of James Bond. The trainers delighted in making us climb up things and clamber down again. There were a few other women, some of them French. There were day manoeuvres and night manoeuvres, and we were often muddy, dirty and tired. And that was just for fitness. Some of them cracked up very quickly because either in terms of physical terms or in terms of strength of character, they just didn't have it. Then the next stage of training was rather ominously called silent killing. And they were trained how to kill people by slitting the throats or um, stabbing them in certain parts of the, of the back so that the person died instantly. Somehow or other, when she found herself an, an agent among many other agents, she was, if not the best in the business at it, she was very, very good at it. And she was, uh, you know, she had journalistic skills, she'd worked as a journalist, so she'd always been good at skullduggery. Basically, and, and now she was being a professional, Stolgagarur or Stolgagares. Well, let me just read to you something from her report. Attracted by adventure and excitement, and at times appears to lack a proper sense of seriousness and responsibility. She is, however, essentially loyal and reliable, and has a marked sense of humour, persistent and determined. She has abundant energy. She knew that the reports were being written on all of them, and she worked out with one of her companions how to break into the, com the commander's office and get her report. The report was very, very good. And she said, she said, you know, to the commander, oh, report was very good, wasn't it? How do you know? She said, well, I broke in and I've had a look at it. You know, so, you know, they're, they're impressed. Then we joined the parachute school. With electric torches, we'd guide planes to the drop zone in a field. So they train her up, but she realises there's a problem up ahead. She's going to have to jump from a plane, parachute, down into occupied France. So what's the way around it? So as she gets in the plane and she's had a coffee and she's had a sandwiches and she's, you know, taking off and she says to the, the American uh, guy behind her, all right, look, come the time, I, I'm not going to be able to do this. You're going to have to give me a shove. And so there she is, and the, it was actually a hole in the floor. And she's looking at it, she's looking and thinking, I don't know if I can do this, I don't know. I wonder, I wonder if he's going to push me. And then <laughs> she's out. <laughs> and she's falling down. England should send us such a beautiful flower. <laughs> Cut out the French bullshit and get me out of this! Madame André? Yes, who are you? Henri Tardiva. At your service! Well, you can start by taking your bloody hands off me. <sighs> Is the radio operator here yet? Dennis Rake, they call him Din Din. No, we have not seen him. Damn. All right, take me to Gaspar. He's still waiting the marquee here. Why, but you don't go to Gaspar. Gaspar comes to you when he is ready. It is his way. Oh, is it now? She was this rumbling volcano of anger, sometimes erupting into you know absolute incandescent rage. But what went with that was this bubbling sexuality and a, and a certain bawdiness that was always present. Uh, when she had to choose a code line for her radio communications with the resistance, uh, she chose a really quite filthy limerick, and it was she stood right there in the moonlight fair, the moonlight through her ninety, the something something, the nipple of her tit, of oh, Jesus Christ Almighty, and that was absolutely typical Nancy. <laughs> Madame, no. This is one of Gaspar's men. Gaspar is here. Why the bloody hell didn't he tell me he was coming? So I finally get to meet the great man, huh? Well, if he thinks I'm hurrying, he can think again. Any signs here? You'll see. No, no radio. No radio. Come here. Gaspar. 
You know why I'm here. Mm. Save us from the German invasion. Mm. You, you won't. I can get all the munitions you need. Oh. My parachute dropped from London. With no radio. Well, my operator will be here. Mm, just says, Denden. Yes. Where is he? Well, I don't know, but he will be here. You are useless. We got this far without you. We finish it without you. It wasn't enough to say, I'm Nancy Way from farm. I'm from the Special Operations Executive. She needed a radio and a radio operator because without that, you know, there's no capacity to call London and, and get, get it all to happen. I've met some arrogant Frenchmen in my time, but Gaspar takes the biscuit. <laughs> he thinks he can. What can you expect? Did you hear that? <laughs> the bastards are talking about me. She has got a pile of honks and a bag of hers. It's there to be taken. Ah, so you are off. I will do it. I will seduce her, kill her, and take the money. Not before I break his neck. <laughs> ah, Marcel. You look upset. I am. Don't worry about Gaspar. He is not used to talking to a woman. Oh, but you are. I can see you have a lot to offer, and I'm ready to listen. But uh, perhaps we should go somewhere more private. How about my room? Oui, good. And would you like to take me to bed as well? I would be honoured, of course. Mm -hmm. And then kill me and steal my money. Is that the plan? No. Do me a favour, mate. Just can try it. Not myself! Forget her, she has nothing. Sorry I'm late, Ducky. Anyone need a radio? <laughs> Missed you. Her radio operator, oddly enough, who was an avowedly gay man in 19, 1940s London, there wouldn't have been many of them. His name was Dennis Rack, Den Den, she called him. But she was so matter-of-fact and so straight up about it. She said, I knew he was a queer, but he was my friend and I loved him. Which, if you think about it, for the 1940s was a pretty progressive attitude. How soon can we arrange a drop? Is tonight good for you? Bloody brilliant. What are the chances of getting a message to La Résistance in Marseille? It's not in the handbook, lovely. No, I know, but... Mon ami, you are about to become the most well-armed marquee leader in all of France. And Gaspard? Who? <laughs> I meant to say, I like the look of this one, yours or mine? Mind on the job, Din Din. Don't believe me, sweetie, it always is. There were many who would, choose, would want to lead that 7,000 men. There was only one of them that could get on the blower and make planes come over and have machine guns come down. Nancy was more than happy to get stuck in and it was by demonstrating that that I think the Marquis sort of thought, hmm, got a slightly odd one here. <laughs> At which point she would frequently bring out a bottle of whiskey and they'd start to drink. She'd start to drink with the local resistance leader and said, all right, let's start drinking. Last man left standing at dawn wins. I have seen some big drinkers in my time. I've been a big drinker in my time. I've never, ever come across anybody that could put it away like Nancy and never turn a hair. Staggering. She had a good time, I think. Um, I remember asking her about her time in London and, you know, was the agenda to get back to France as soon as possible to see what happened to Henri. And she says, well, no, no, that wasn't the motive. I said, so what was the motive? She said to be parachuted in, one woman with 7,000 marquee. What would you do, Roger? What would you think? And gave me a bit of a wink. So I think she had a good time with the marquee. And again, I said to her once, I said, look, you know, you, you really liked Henri Tardivar. He's a rugby player. He's a Frenchman. It's a cold and lost and lonely night. Did you ever, with any, any of, and, she, and what she said, her exact words, she said, if I had accommodated one of them, I would have had to have accommodated all of them. So she said she had took no lovers in the forest. Move, move. 
You know who he is? He betrayed O'Leary. And that's of my say. I hate the bastard as much as you do. More. So why did you try to stop me? Let's give him a taste of his own medicine. Turn into Nazis, you mean? Think like they think. Do what they do. Is that what we're fighting for? What? No. It's time to put this prick out of his misery. <laughs> If you don't do it, I will. After the D-Day landings in France in 1944, the Allied commander, American General Dwight Eisenhower, personally thanked the Special Operations Executive. He said the invasion of Normandy would not have succeeded without the incredible efforts of the French resistance, many of them trained or armed by SOE agents. Nancy's coming into her own. This is now, you know, Thunderbirds are go. You've got the men, you've got the money, you've got the guns, you've got the ammunition. This is what you've got to do. So that, you know, they worked out where the divisions were coming from, the Germans. They'll be coming on this railway, they'll be crossing this embankment, you know, passing through this mountain pass. Hit, hit, hit. And so she leads these forces in these attacks on the Germans, trying to get to, to, to send the landing. We were flat out, buggering up everything we could. We blew up bridges, railway lines, roads, all day and all night. What did the Nazis do? They burned houses, hanged innocent people, shot them against walls, when they couldn't get who they really wanted. Us, the Marquis. In the part of France that I was living in, I believe La Gaillard, the nearby town of Tulle, there had been, the resistance had been active, and the Germans came through that town and said, okay, you wanna, you wanna, you wanna take pot shots at us? Okay, get a hundred men. They got a hundred men, and they hung them from a hundred lampposts. One hundred of them. Say, so, okay, anybody else wanna take pot shots at us? Still, we were getting more recruits by the day. So now Gaspar had 5,000 men camped on a mountain plateau. Obviously a juicy target. But even with 15,000 German troops headed our way, he was still too pig-headed to listen to me. These men have come here to fight the Germans. They've got mobile artillery, a thousand armoured vehicles, ten planes, and what have you got? Guts! We do not run like you Britons. No. We fight them to the death. You are outnumbered. You will never win. Your men will die. You go! You leave us! These are your escape routes when you come to your senses. For God's sake, use them! for my own escape route. I knew I wouldn't be able to play the sexy housewife or flash a bit of tit to get through. <laughs> Not this time. Not driving a car away from a full-on German assault. Bloody time, too. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I had to do it. We were utterly surrounded. I, I, I do just. Do what? <sighs> it was so desperate that at one point her radio operator thought, they're about to take me. They're about, I've got to destroy the radio. I've got to destroy the codes. I've got to do it. So he destroys the whole thing. Just at the last, they managed to get away. You know, we're alive. We're, you know, we're, we're, all, we're all good. We're alive. And then then says, yes, we are alive, but we haven't got the radio. And without the radio, it's 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 you know Samson without his hair. It it's 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 John Wayne without a gun. There's nothing they can do. And so Nancy realizes we need we need a radio and we need a radio fast. It's an SOE radio at Chateau Vu. That is a four hundred kilometer round trip. Ah, no, no, no. There are roadblocks everywhere. We never get through. I could. On a bicycle. With no backup, no identity papers. I can handle the checkpoints, I've done it before. Fear them. Look, what other choice do we have? 
with no radio. We have no contact with London, no intel, no weapons. We can't even organise the Marquis. We're just a bunch of French ferals running around in the forest. It is true. No! Put on the meal. I'm making that bike ride. Oh, Nancy, love, it's a small problem. No bicycle. Well, you haven't heard the old French joke. What's the gypsy recipe for chicken soup? First, steal a chicken. And that's how, in that big bike ride, she didn't think about how she was going to get through those checkpoints. She, she would do that when she got there. She would assess the situation quickly, charm or lie her way through. It wasn't some grand plan. I'd barely ever ridden a bike before, and by 40 k's in, I was knackered. One more turn. One more turn. My heart sank at every checkpoint, but I smiled and flirted with the guards, when what I longed to do was blow their ugly mugs off. the message to London all right and I hope to hell we'd get our new radio or we were screwed and then it was on your bike Nancy that damn bike I was past exhausted but it was 200 kilometers back to my men so off I pedaled one more turn one more turn when she'd been on the bike it was so exhausting and she didn't dare stop she actually wet herself while she was sitting you know, on the seat of the bike because she was so desperate to complete the journey. Nancy said to me that the bike ride was the proudest thing that she'd ever done and that she felt it was the bravest thing that she'd ever done. Oh God, what have you done to yourself? There is uh, a slight sense of awe being with somebody who has achieved so much in their lifetime, um, but also somebody for whom my generation owes a debt of gratitude. She was an extraordinary woman, and she, she and I had quite a few blues early on until we both came to the conclusion that she was ten times the man that I would ever be. Ah, ta-da! Airmail from London, Cherub. All thanks to you. <laughs> oh. You never guess what else. Tardy's planning a hit and run. On what? The Gestapo headquarters at Mont Luzon, all the top brass. That little shit. It's my bloody idea. <laughs> Thought you might be interested. The raid was arranged for when those thugs were enjoying their pre lunch drinks. Tardy Bar sent me through the back door. Did it bother me, killing those men in cold blood? Not for a second. I remembered the tortured Jews in Vienna, the pregnant French woman bayoneted in front of her screaming child. My friend in the resistance who'd had his head cut off with an axe. If you ask me, the only good Nazi is a dead one. She had a wonderful war. She had the time of her life. And when peace arrived in 1945, the party was suddenly all over. I really don't think that life was ever the same for Nancy after that. Simply because the, all the fun was gone. She enjoyed the, the daring do, she en enjoyed the gun battles. And then suddenly when there's no war to fight anymore, then you've kind of got to go back to ordinary life. Paris was won, but the South fought on until the liberation of Vichy. Part of the liberating trip. She was in one of the first trucks that got in there, chased the Germans out, and they haul up, you know, the 
the, the tricolor and they play the Marseillaise and they're all in the square and you know, Vichy is free again, France is free. And she sees somebody that from, from the old days back in Marseille. It's so good to see you. And you, you look wonderful. <laughs> Are you going back to Marseille? I'm heading there this afternoon. Why? To see Henri, of course. Oh, no. I thought you knew. She hoped, I think, that he had got away and was hiding somewhere or at, at the very worst was in prison. Uh, she thought he was very brave to stay behind. She thought that was um, pretty heroic. Andre Fiocca. Came to see me, Henri, at home. Odin. The Gestapo. They told me they know who your wife is, that she is this white mouse they are looking for. They told me I can take you to a hospital. All you have to do is confirm who Nancy is and tell them what she did. Where you think she could be? Nazis. They can burn in hell. She's not worth this. She's not worth my son's life. Never speak of this again. He was so generous, so kind. He always gave me everything I asked for. He was a lovely, lovely man. It was dawn on the 16th of October, 1943. When I woke up, I told myself over and over, it was just a dream. It was just a dream. Well, how could I have kept going? I don't think she would have forgiven herself for, for what happened to him. Uh, I think the sacrifice that she made uh, when she left France and went to go and fight with the SOE um, was potentially too great a sacrifice for her to bear. Madame? Do you know what happened to him? Son. Tell me. It started with that traitor you warned us about. The Nouveau. While O'Leary was rotting in jail, he came by information that he needed to pass on to the Marseille resistance. A prisoner he trusted was about to be released, so he gave him a message to pass to Henri, using a code that he would recognize. The prisoner was a Gestapo agent. When I asked Nancy about Henri and how she coped with his, his death, she had a very far away look in her eye. And she said to me, uh, I loved him. Uh, Henri Fiocca was his name. Uh, and he was a wonderful man. And interestingly, his photograph uh, was stuck to the wall next to her bed. No sign of her second husband, uh, but there's no doubt that Henri Fiocca was the love of her life.